Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Danone North America, the world's largest B Corp committed to doing all kinds of better for people and the planet. Learn more at DenoneAwayFromHome.com. Welcome to Jupiter's Almanac. I'm Matthew Rayford, the great-great-great-grandson of Jupiter Gilliard, a former slave who bought the land I now farm in Georgia nearly 150 years ago. Through the years, my ancestors have passed on some essential and hard-earned wisdom about growing and producing the food we eat. It's my great honor to share that inheritance and to invite other farmers from Georgia and around the country to share their tips with you. It's an opportunity for us to slow down and to connect and to plug in. And the farm does that in a way that lets you connect and appreciate the life that exists and nurture and cultivate that and then extend that to the relationships to the people who are in that house with you and your community. So if you are just starting out, reconnecting with the land, or a seasoned farmer, join the conversation. And to be honest with you, it was like, would Warren come out and say, hey, I want to be a farmer? Probably not. I I consider myself a city kid. You know, when we initially got a horse, you know, I have that New York City mindset a horse i'm thinking thoroughbred horse aqueduct racetrack (laughs) belmont racetrack those type of things you know and 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 slowly but surely i'm starting to understand a lot more i do remember early on like you know the first month or two of dating how we would daydream about starting a farm together and it's kind of like hold on let's like pump the brakes and get to know each other first and then talk about that you know So what got me into chickens? Um, I always joke and say that a chicken saved my life, Um, and it very much so did. I'm interested in Black liberation that's ecological and that's not contingent upon (sighs) these systems giving us anything. There's also something that's beyond this that I want and that I seek for for our people, and that's intimacy with the land and that's reliability. And so for us, it's also this idea of connecting people back to the land and connecting our um, folks back to their ancestry. So what does it mean to organically, sustainably farm in our current economy and time? Please subscribe to Jupiter's Almanac wherever you get your podcast. Welcome to All in the Industry on Heritage Radio Network. I'm your host, Sherry Bayer, and it is Wednesday, October 7th, 2020. This is the 267th episode of this series, which is dedicated to behind-the-scenes talent in the hospitality industry. Today, my guests are twin brothers who have combined their careers with food and music. 
and I will introduce them fully in a moment. First, as I do on every show, I will start out with my PR tip, and then later we will have my speed round game, industry news discussion, solo dining experience, and the final question. As the founder of Bayer Public Relations, I'm going to tip the show off with my PR tip of the week. So today's tip is to have your finger on the pulse. Yes, be aware of what's happening around us, from our work to where we live and our surroundings. Take it all in, so we are always ready to take action. Being on top of things will not only help us get by day to day, but get ahead and allow us to plan for a better future. So be in the know and the now. That's my tip today. Now I'm really excited to have two guests joining me. They are Darren Bresnitz and Greg Bresnitz, twin brothers who are the co-founders and co-hosts of the music and food podcast, Snacky Tunes, which has been broadcasting here on Heritage Radio Network since 2009. Darren and Greg have a brand new book out. It's called Snacky Tunes, Music is the Main Ingredient, Chefs and Their Music, and it features 77 of the world's top chefs who share personal stories of how music has influenced their lives and more. So hello, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Hello. Hi. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you, it's an honor. My pleasure, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you. I was, uh, I was on Snacky Tunes back a couple years ago with Greg, so um, it's, it's like, you know, I have to reciprocate here and it's, it's, it's about time, I'd say. <laughs> uh, well, we finally have something to talk about. Yes. Yes, we have a lot to talk about. Um, so uh, your book, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited about it. Let's, let's start out before we get to that a bit on your backgrounds. Like where did you guys grow up and, and how did you first get involved in the hospitality industry? So we grew up in Philadelphia, uh, born in Philadelphia, raised in Ballot on the main line. And we have always had food and music in our lives. Both of our grandparents and our mother were fantastic cooks, at-home chefs, if you will, pulling everything from Eastern European influences where they're from, from Poland on our mother's side and Hungary on our father's side. Um, and then my, my mom, our mom was a really exceptional cook. She really got into cooking in the 70s and what we took for granted or didn't really understand growing up is that we were really getting three course European style meals every night, um, at home. And then our father, uh, was really into music group in Montreal. And he was the guy who, when he was dating my mom in Brooklyn would actually pick up LPs, um, Fleetwood Mac, Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, what have you, and Beatles, and then bring them back to, uh, Canada and play them for his friends before they were available. Um, up in Montreal. So we really had a great big um, food and, and music growing up. And uh, we, um, you know, just sort of fell into it. Greg got into the hospitality business. I got more into the media business, uh, went to school for television. And that is really where the idea of putting food and music first came together. So when did you start working together and, and, Obviously, my tip, I was thinking of you guys with finger on the pulse. Which, appreciate it. Um, Love it. I appreciate it because, you know, 200 plus shows in, I need help on these tips. <laughs> um, we So uh, I had worked at a college radio station and picked up DJing my senior year in college. And Darren was already living in New York. We're identical twins, but I had taken a year off. So uh, I assumed that I was just going to move out there. And I really wanted to get into DJing. Darren was playing soul vinyl records, and I was playing DFA, dance punk, phones, remixes. And at the time, you could go on Craigslist and look for DJ gigs. And the DJ gigs were come play for an hour, you get an hour, there's three other strangers who get an hour, and best hour wins like a hundred bucks, some drinks, and a free, another DJ set, which seemed like too much work and we were not that talented. So we did see one ad for this guy, whose name was Don Peavy, who ran a place called the Graham Lounge that said, was looking for steady DJs second and fourth Fridays. Uh, I sent him a note, 
He said, come by and see me when you get to town. Um, I flew into town 10 days later. I knocked on the door of the Graham Lounge, which was this seedy Italian gentleman's club that was owned by the landlord on the block. And they gave us second and fourth Fridays. And we put the name Finger on the Pulse together, which comes from a block party song. And that's how we started working together, throwing parties every other Friday for about eight years. Oh, wow. And so then how did your Heritage Radio Network show come about? Because people ask me now all the time, or they assume I was one of, you know, one of the very first shows or when Heritage launched. And I said, well, I've been running now for six years and, and, and consistently of, you know, one of the longer running shows at this point, but you guys started five years ahead of me. I mean, I was in 2014, you guys started in 2009. So you were really uh, the, the beginning. So we, um, had this show on IFC called dinner with the band, which really brought together food and music for the first time in sort of any media landscape uh, as a cooking show. And we were still DJing on the side and we uh, had met Brandon Hoy, who was bartending at this bar, Roberta's. Um, Sorry, he was bartending at uh, the Royal Oak and then said he was leaving to start Roberta's. And so then we found out about Heritage Radio Network through him. And, you know, as Greg mentioned, he had been doing radio And we already had the food and music concept and we were just looking for another outlet to tell more stories on a more uh, weekly basis. You know, with the cooking show, it was pretty much a set of the stories we're going to tell. We had one uh, incredible chef, Sam Mason, but we couldn't really feature any of the other food people that we were becoming friends with or who we wanted to shine a spotlight on. And so we sat down with Patrick Martins uh, in Williamsburg and sort of sketch out the idea of a food and music show. And that's how Snacky Tunes was born. Um, and that, you know, they just never told us to stop. They still haven't told us to stop. We're still putting up shows every week. And I think we both come to the mindset that if we still want to do it and there's still stories to tell and they haven't said, you know, stop doing the show, that's how you get to about 450 plus episodes after 11 seasons. It's amazing. So has the format of your show changed over the years or has it always been that you have a guest that's more food focused and then you have a a musical performance? The format is pretty much the same. I think there was a really bad attempt that we uh, Mm. tried to do Mm -hmm. segments like what you Mm -hmm. do. You you do your your show exceptionally well. It's very well researched. It's very current. You know what's going on. I think we like tried to be current guys <laughs> and we talked about food trucks as a new thing because this was 2009 and that lasted maybe one or two episodes uh, and then we just really did it how we've always done it where first half is two-part chef interview and then the second part is band interview with three live songs we used to do more djs in the beginning and dj sets because we were djs at the time but as we got out of that and also realized that live music was just a much better format we swapped over to that, but the, I'd say maybe from like episode 75 on, it's very much the same format, uh, unless it's a live round panel discussion. Mm-hmm. And then the one other thing is that we have expanded our chef interviews to outside of New York only, um, since we went from being a live show to pretty much now a pre-recorded show. Uh, and Travel the World, we usually bring a long recorder with us or... You know, obviously now post-pandemic, but even before that, we were using Zencaster and things like that. So um, I live in L.A., and so the last five years since I've lived out here, I've been able to really share a lot of L.A. chef stories, which has been just perfect timing as the scene has. I mean, it was exploding before I got here, and now it's on just a different sort of path. But it's allowed us to just um, show show more, more sides of the culinary industry, um, but we have had to sort of put away that live element, which you know, was a lot of fun, but a little bit tougher as you get older with more responsibilities. Yeah, I hear you. And thank you for saying that about my show. It's um, you guys, you know, have are, have are pros. And so to get a some some nice compliment from you, it, it makes me makes me feel good. And um, yeah, my show, I try to it's I, I have so many things that are um, relevant, I guess, to today or with the industry news that it is hard to go out of order or pre-record, but um, 
I think we're all, you know, making the best of this now with doing things remotely. And, and it's great to take advantage also as well that we can talk to people anywhere in the world and, get, you know, don't necessarily have to get their, them out to uh, Bushwick. But um, let's talk a bit about this book you have. So when did the idea come about to take your Snacky Tunes concept and, and do a book? And then how did you go about the process of, of creating it in the format? Uh, that, that is a multi, multi-part answer, but <laughs> we had been doing the show um, for a number of seasons, uh, for a number of seasons, I believe we were on season six. Um, and as Darren mentioned, we'd done a number of live events, which was our barbecue blowout series, which was high-end chefs doing their take on barbecue food. Um, we had also done some live events uh, and a couple other things, but some consulting didn't, work, right? Yeah, some, yeah, some consulting work, but none of it was really doing kind of what we thought we wanted to do to expand the Snacky Tunes universe. Uh, and I had a good friend who just always asked me, like, you guys have been doing this for six years. What are you doing with it? And it never really had a good answer. Um, so, in July 2017, I was going through a pretty rough patch in time and went to go visit a friend that was living in Mexico City. And he and a friend was like, you know what? You've been moping around, you've got this thing. You, you should turn, turn Snacking Tunes in the book. How hard could it be? And okay. so the original idea is that we were just gonna go back and transcribe all of the chef interviews and do something. And we realized very quickly that that was uh, not going to be as easy. It would be a lot of like square, square peg, round hole type stuff. So, we just went out and be like, all right, well, we know there's this through line from doing interviews about chefs and music. And we know that a lot of the chefs are either former musicians or, you know, they are also artists and use uh, creativity in the way they work with food, the same way that musicians work with notes to express human emotion. Why don't we try to get that story? So we developed a questionnaire, we put a proposal together, and we have a very long running relationship with Faden who's one of the most incredible publishers in the world, not because they made our book, that's just fact. They've been around for 100 plus years, they make beautiful things. we had had them on our show and we're friendly with them and we were working on this proposal and, and spoke with Emily Takudas, who was our commissioning editor, if she would look at it, thinking that she would maybe pass this along to someone else. She said, sure, I'm happy to pass it along, but can I look at this first? We got very nervous because <laughs> we didn't think that that would ever be an option. And she looked at it and it was go from there. Um, I know Emily, she was a guest on my show too. And I, I, I she's, she's wonderful. And the books that fight in uh, produces uh, are, are fabulous. So I think that's great. You had that connection. Uh, I think the only thing to, you know, if I can add is that um, for people who think about writing a book or, or taking what they do and turning it into a different form, just do it. You never know. I, you know, even today, sometimes when I, I pick up the book and I look at it, I see your names with Faden, and then I see everyone who gave so much of themselves to the book and put together. It's sometimes hard to believe. And I think um, it was a lot of work and it was a lot of uh, putting it together and a lot of trust on all sides. Um, and we felt that we did a good job respecting and representing the chefs and supporting the independent restaurant community. But just, you know, sometimes people don't take that leap. And I think that it's important to sometimes that it's, if you have a dream and you have a desire and you think that you have something to say, the worst thing you could do is is not try. Yeah, I, I think that's great advice. So how did you decide which chefs to include in the book? I'm, I'm familiar with with sure. well, many, but one in particular, Eric Bruner Yang of Maketo, I was involved a little bit with with his um, participation because I was I was working with him at the time. You guys were putting this together. So we originally were tasked with picking fifty chefs, and it was going to be always an international book. So half were going to be from America, and then half were going to be from the rest of the world. And when you're thinking about a compilation book, you can really think about it, about curating a music festival. So to get the buzz, to get sort of people interested, you obviously want to have the headlining chefs. And once we started to realize how many headlining chefs from all over the world that we wanted to get, 
we felt that we wanted to do extra digging into some of the chefs that you may have not been familiar with from regions of the world that you may not have known of. And that includes us, right? So some of the chefs are friends, some of the chefs are colleagues, and then some of the chefs were just cold emails and calls, right? We did our research. We we have chefs from all six continents. It is a um, racially diverse book. It is a gender diverse book. It is a truly just what we hope is a representation of the world. And that got us to about 86 participants. Um, and we just kept adding more chefs. You know, we hit 50 really quickly. And we kept saying uh, with our partner, Kong, we're like, it needs more. It doesn't feel rounded enough. It doesn't feel rounded enough. And we'd so, you know, Greg would do some outreach and I would do some outreach. And we're like, ah, it doesn't feel round enough. And then when we finally got towards the end, we sort of like picked our heads up and we're like, okay, we have almost uh, double the amount <laughs> that we said that we were going to deliver. But that's when we actually felt like the book really was a representation of, of this global community of food and music. Yeah, well, I give you a lot of credit. Also, getting this information from chefs isn't isn't they're not the easiest people to collect things from. Mm. <laughs> but you put it together, and then so what's the what's the you would say maybe the common thread or something across the book that you saw between between chefs and music, or or is is there one, or is everyone's taste a little different, um, and how it ties to their recipes? So, you know, we found a through line, right? Now, with some of the older chefs, and this is very interesting, um, when they were children, food did not have the same cultural and professional cachet as it does now, right? And so for a lot of them, music was the first thing they fell in love with. And music was the first thing that they connected with their parents and their grandparents. And if they didn't have a good relationship with their family, they connected with other people, right? And then as they got older and food's relationship with the world and how it became more of this pop culture, viable relationship uh, to success and things like that, um, they sort of fell in love with food as well as they did with music. And then sometimes food and music was with them. From the start, in the same way that we related to us, that food and music was always there. So what you found is these people who were able to look towards other artists for inclusion or understanding of emotions, um, connectivity between people, and then take those ideas, internalize it, and then re-express it themselves through food with their restaurants and things like that. And some of the chefs like a Mark Vetri, who's also a musician um, or, or uh, you know, Eric used to play in a band, um, you know, they use music as well, but it's using that, that uh, artistic discipline to connect people and to express themselves. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you have any favorite recipes in the book or, or ones that stand out? We, you know, we've, we've gotten the, do you have any favorites? Uh, and we just, we want to pull back because what we found from all of these chefs is that we got so much more out of them. I, you know, it, I think from the original proposal where, I, where at least I thought we'd be, it's like, we'd get some like insights, tips, how music is used in, rest, in restaurant, how it's used to make a dish, maybe one or two cool stories, some playlists. And like, that would be, you know, maybe two clicks down on the narrative. When we started doing this book and we were asking the questions and everyone got the same questions and we tried to make them, you know, we built the world. Uh, so it would be something along the lines of, tell us a story about music in your childhood or how does music interact with your, your culture? And we'd just leave it as blank as possible and then sit back and let the chefs answer us. And what we got were some of the most warm, open, honest, raw, heartbreaking, truly deep stories from people that, as Darren mentioned, were complete strangers three minutes before we started asking them questions. And we never did the interviews together. We had to divide and conquer. So we would be doing the interviews and something, a story would come up about someone's grandparents um, or this incredible hunt they did as a child or just how they use music to get them through uh, an abortion or a difficult time. 
And we would just text each other and we'd be like, two things, this is incredible and why are they sharing this with us? And we realized that so many of these chefs, and I share, I think you probably know this best, they're so media trained. They say the same thing over and over again, they hit their marks, they, they hit their points, they talk about their restaurant, they talk about the dishes, their, their inspiration, but most of them never did an in-depth interview about music. And it really just tapped into something different. And they just got lost in their own stories, their memories, their, their childhood, their, their first love. And from there, everyone just gave us something special. Every bird, everybody we interviewed has something truly unique and truly memorable in the book. So it's a little bit hard to answer the favorite. I think what we found by people who've gotten copies of this is that they identify with certain chefs more then they identify with other stories just because it speaks to their condition. But I don't know if there's only one favorite that I could actually pick out. Um, that being said, I don't want to leave people with the fact that uh, the answer is, well, I love all my children equally the same. Or like, <laughs> how can you pick a favorite season? Um, but to Greg's point, we're really hoping that people connect to this book in their own way since there's so many different ways. So I can say that um, Elena Rizzo's uh, recipe, which um, I believe is called From Mud to Chaos, really spoke to the full artistic, you know, uh, top quadrant of like when food is art, what could it actually be? You know? And then Noah Sandoval's um, Is This What You Wanted uh, inspired uh, Rai Capolini was, you know, a, a very warm, comforting pasta dish that, uh, with his playlist, um, definitely had the most personal relationship to me. I would say that his playlist really was like looking at my old mixtapes. Wow. Well, that is a perfect segue into my question from my last guest who on episode 266, I had on David Nafeld. He's the executive chef and co-owner of Cafico and Cafico Elementari in San Francisco. Mm. And he recently launched his own podcast, which is called The Made Ingredient. So everything ties together on the show. Um, but his question was, What's on your playlist right now? And he also noted there are a lot of parallels that he, that he found between becoming a chef and becoming a musician. Mm. Greg, you want to go first or do you want me to kick off what's on my playlist right now? Yeah. So I, I have a newborn daughter or I guess she's eight months now. So she's, not, she's still new relatively to everyone Pretty new. else. <laughs> Pretty new. And we have been playing a lot of neoclassical music. So Niels from Avril Pratt, Max Richter, Philip Glass, Nadia Sirota, who was actually a musician guest on Snacky Tunes, which was probably one of the most incredible mini concerts I ever had the privilege of sitting across. And any type of Spotify radio station that is tied to those. Uh, and then I would also say that The Law Radio, which is a shipping container in Brooklyn, is just another one where we have our friends play on it. That is like when I just get tired of listening to, to that. We haven't dipped into children music quite yet, so I'm cherishing the like new lullabies that we get to listen to. And my daughter is a bit older, <laughs> and we are uh, definitely full on Disney right now. So think Brave, think Aladdin, Jungle Book, <laughs> what you will. Uh, and then for when I can listen to my own stuff, I've been listening to a lot of, um, I guess I would say, I don't know if it's post-hardcore or just punk. So uh, Idols have a new album. I've been digging up the old White Lung albums. Uh, which I've absolutely been loving, and shout out to Domino Records, uh, Pup, who have a new EP coming out. I'm super excited about, and then also some more of the introspective stuff. So, Godspeed You, Black Emperor, Explosions in the Sky, um, Rachel's for the more when I need to write or develop something, um, and then Sunday mornings is you know a bit of a jazz, Thelonious Monk, John Coltrane, Nina Simone. Um, eat of pee off type of vibe, which we like to do when we cook together as a family. Mm, awesome. I like that. Okay. So let's take a little break here and we'll come back and we'll play my speed round game. We'll talk some industry news. 
I'll have my solo dining experience in the final question. This is All in the Industry on Heritage Radio Network. Every time your customers eat and drink, they vote for the world they want to live in. And as the world's largest B Corp, to know North America helps people vote for a better world with all kinds of better dairy, coffee, and plant-based products sourced and produced transparently. To know North America has the brands people know and love, like International Delight, Oikos, Silk, So Delicious Dairy Free, Horizon Organic, and Stoke Cold Brew Coffee. But to know North America represents more than just in-demand brands and better for your business products. They bring their B Corp certification to life in ways that protect the environment and communities by utilizing 100% renewable electricity sources to produce their products at their manufacturing facilities, committing $6 million to programs that restore the soil's ability to capture and sequester carbon, helping to restore more than 7.8 billion gallons to freshwater ecosystems through their water partnerships over the past decade, and committing to 100% reusable, recyclable, and compostable packaging by 2025. Learn how you can choose better at DenoneAwayFromHome.com. Welcome back to All in the Industry on Heritage Radio Network. I'm your host, Sherry Bayer. My guests today are Darren and Greg Bresnitz of Snacky Tunes here on Heritage Radio and also of Snacky Tunes. Music is the main ingredient, Chefs and Their Music, which is their new book with Biden, and it is now out, so you can get it. Um, Okay, so it's time for my speed round game. Uh, Darren and Greg, I am going to give you a couple of choices, and you get to pick your preference, such as chocolate or vanilla. So, are you ready? Okay. Should we okay. should we self identify because our voices sound the same? Um, sure. Or if I, if one of you wants to go first, or 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 you could, however, or um. Uh, Greg, Darren, Greg, why don't, you, why don't you go first? Oh, so you can always top my answer. I just go I'll, go. I'll, go. I'll go. I'll go first. No, I'm, I'm confident. I'm confident. You're I'm confident. confident. I'm confident. Okay. I'm confident. <laughs> yeah, I was. I wasn't sure if how that was going to roll. Who'd go first? But no, we'll I'm figure confident. this out. I got this. Okay, here we go. Eat in or eat out. Eat in. Eat in. Um, Pre-March answer. Eat out. Ah. Uh, that's yeah i hear you okay wine beer cocktail mocktail or champagne wine hmm depends on the mood uh i would say wine first and then ease into a cocktail yeah and have you never listened to this you get one answer no qualifier (laughs) i mean (laughs) hey no 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 no, one one answer no qualifier cocktail (laughs) It's, it's, it's fabulous. Okay, how about tasting menu or a la carte? A la carte. A la carte. Small plates or large plates? Large plates. Large plates. Communal table or chef's counter? Oh. Communal table or chef's counter? Communal table. Ooh, chef's counter. You gotta watch the show. <laughs> Tipping or all inclusive charge? Oh, come on, that's not fair. Uh, knowing what I know, all inclusive. Yeah, I mean, that's if, if everyone could be trusted to tip correctly. Darren, I, just answer. That, that is a complicated question. I mean, that's we the could point spend a whole game. Uh, then, the then, 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 yes, all, all inclusive for the betterment of the industry. Yeah, that 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 one that over over my time in doing this game, that one does get people a little stumped up. So um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll we'll keep going. I have a few more. Oh, yeah. How about hosting a podcast or writing a book? Hosting a podcast. 
hosting a podcast. Ooh. <laughs> How about um, DJs or live bands? Live bands. Yeah, live bands. Although when we started, DJs. There. <laughs> It's, it's it's all good. Okay, the last two are cheese plate or dessert? Cheese plate. Cheese plate. Manhattan or Brooklyn or Los Angeles or wherever else you you are living these days? <laughs> Brooklyn. 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 Awesome. Cheese plates in Brooklyn. That's that's what I got out of the game. That's the <laughs> name of our that's actually the name of our autobiographies. Really? Yeah. <laughs> we, we actually do a second. We do a second. Bit for you? Yeah. 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 It's our second book, Cheese Plates in Brooklyn. Yeah. It's, a, it's our second podcast under pseudonyms. It was a breed type of evening. I yeah. want credit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you get 10% of all the podcast profits. Fabulous. Okay. Uh, for industry news, I picked out an article that was uh, on a website called The Counter. Mm. And the title is Digital Menus Have Long Faced Resistance from U.S. Customers. COVID-19 is appending that. This is by Jonah Miller, who is a restaurateur. He has Huertas, which is in the East Village. It's a really great tapas restaurant. Um, so, uh, you know, with the times of what's happening, everything with dining out and, and restaurants and this new this new trend to or trend, this new uh, way of having a menu um, that you scan your uh, QR code and you look at the menu on your phone has become a thing. Uh, figured I'd get your opinions on on this. Any thoughts? Oh, um, you know, I've been out to eat three times, four times um, since March. Two of those experiences had digital menus um, I don't know. I mean, it's just the whole thing's so weird. And, um, you know, I get the safety of it, but part of what I love going out to eat was the walking into the room and the whole ritual and getting the menu and the escapism of it. And, um, scanning a menu is just another reminder of where we are right now. And that's not I know that can sound elitist and being like, well, I want a menu. Um, and I don't actually believe uh, in giving out menus. I, I, I agree that this is like a really great solve and it's great. The technology is there, but man, if it just does, doesn't give one more reminder of like how tough it is right now. That being said, if um, digital menus is what allows people to go out and to eat and survive and be safe and things like that, then I'm 100% for them. And, um, you know, cuts down on waste, especially people if they're doing daily specials and swapping out menus, you know, um, as the seasons change. My, my wife and I have actually been a little bit more, well, we're down in Lafayette, Louisiana, and there's just a lot of outdoor seating where we are. I, I have not even thought twice about the digital menu. Uh, I just think it's a good safety precaution and like, it's just one less thing that people have to worry about. We pull out our phones and scan it and it's not, it's not really one thing or the other. Um, I don't think most menus uh, at the place that we're eating, um, or in general, unless they're like beautifully well designed, um, necessitates things. And it's, you know, lower carbon footprint. So I, I'm actually all for it. Yeah, it's been interesting for me. I've, I've been out, I don't know, maybe seven or eight times. And most of the restaurants I've been to, um, are, are, do have uh, menus that you scan and on on your phone? Um, there have been some places that have the paper menus, and it's it's been interesting watching the etiquette. I was out to dinner with someone the other night that thought the the scanned menus was here to stay, and that was just going to be the new normal. Um, I did have, I guess, one of my most interesting uh, experiences with this was I went to Thai Diner. Mm. And the, which is fabulous, and they it's so eat, good. It's Their so breakfast good. sandwich is insane. I mean, I'm I'm sad Uncle Boone's closed, but I long live Thai diner. 
Yeah, no, I want. I I was so sad about Uncle Boone's too, and I so I I, def, I was like I've been going there. I wanted to go and support them, but what they had interesting is, and we found this out because I didn't understand how they knew it was our food. But basically, every table has its own code on it because we scanned the code, ordered off of our phones, never told them like where we were or anything. And then our food just arrived. So we talked to the, the manager and she said, yeah, every table has its own code. So that's how they know, which I thought was interesting. Interesting. I mean, I've also seen taped laminated menus when you walk up to a counter um, that no one touches and things like that. Y- you know, you bring up a good point though of what's going to stay and what's going to change post the pandemic. And, you know, I know that we were joking during the speed round, which I may have not gotten the concept of, but, uh, you know, the tipping versus not versus all inclusive, I think is an argument that is going to go from argument to a real examination of what does it take to be a restaurant worker and who gets to make the money um, and who, you know, is actually getting paid for a very aggressive day of work. And so I think you'll be looking at everything from uh, cost and wages as far as employees all the way up to, you know, types of uh, menus and things like that. And then safety and, and health and, and things like that. I mean, there are so many things I never considered walking into a restaurant pre-COVID as far as like touching menus or going to bathrooms, you know, just the shared space. And just in some ways you go like, wow, I can't believe I wasn't more sick for the amount of times that I would go out to eat. So, right. you know, it's – it's uh, a. <laughs> It's just like, well, you know, what's going to what's going to stay the same and how is the industry going to change? And, you know, you start kicking it up even further of with the, the the Heroes Act and how much support restaurants really need to sustain themselves. And, you know, should it be seen as, you know, a treat or can it be treated as something every day while keeping the prices low? It's just like it's really caused everyone to sort of stop going out in this like forward momentum and, and really examine about what's going on. Yeah, I hear you. It is. Um, I mean, it will be interesting to see what what happens in the future, and and um, even 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 with masks or, or you know, even I don't know. No. Now all the restaurants have arrows on the floor showing you which way to walk. Like, I, I don't know what's what's gonna yeah what's gonna the future's gonna look like. But it's I'm I'm all for taking all the safety precautions um, that the restaurants are doing to make people feel safe and make their, and have their servers feel safe. I mean, it's, it's important. Yeah. You know, it'll be interesting to see also, you know, when you think, you know, living out in LA um, we are lucky enough to have outdoor dining year round because of the weather. Um, I Mm -hmm. think this, this winter is going to be, I'm not even going to, codify i think it's going to decimate the industry without any federal support i just don't see it i just don't see people in those like couple of you know could you imagine people going outside and sitting outside to eat or going out in cold and flu season or something like that in a january february march in like chicago or new york or portland maine or something like that like it's just freezing and i just don't see how even now like losing a quarter of your revenue during that time how that's sustainable. So it's, you know, without real loans, without, uh, you know, financial support on a major level, it's going to be really tough. Um, and that's not to say that the, the you know, the Louisiana's, California's, the places of the world that can exist um, without a harsh winter are going to, you know, have some sort of cakewalk. Um, I, I think that you're going to really need a, a full propping up of the whole industry that generates so much money. That's one of the things that I've learned. How much money, how many people are employed through the independent restaurant community um, on a national, international level. And it's, you know, it's 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 a benefit for the economy overall. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's been, I mean, in, in, being in New York now, the weather's been wonderful. And it, you, it's starting to get a little colder, but you, I don't think, I think you kind of forget when it's so nice out now that it is going to be freezing soon. And what are we going to do? A hundred percent. 
I will have to see um, how this goes. But uh, I will share now my my solo dining experience that I had, which I went to Gramercy Tavern mm. Outdoor Dining. So um, here's the rundown. The location, 42 East 20th Street, Flatiron District, New York City. The concept, Union Square Hospitality Group's Contemporary Seasonal American Restaurant, which opened in, in New York City in 1994. And so it's now it's in its 26th year, which is incredible. And it's one of America's most beloved restaurants. The owner is Danny Meyer, and the executive chef is Michael Anthony, who is on my show on episode 229. So why did I go? Well, I'm a big fan of Gramercy Tavern, and I wanted to support them. So my experience, this is um, about a week and a half ago on a Friday night, I got a reservation for one and I was warmly greeted. I was seated at a table on the far side of the street. This is one of the city blocks that has um, city city streets of the weekend, open streets. So they had the whole block and it's a great block. Um, East 20th Street has a lot of wonderful restaurants on it. So there was a good vibe. Um, Interesting. My we had a white tablecloth on the table, and there was a hand sanitizer there, branded Gramercy Tavern, and they had double sided paper menu: drinks on one side, food on the other. Um, the f- service was really friendly. Um, I asked if Michael was there because obviously I know him, and he came out, and we had a nice, we nice conversation. We took a photo that could be our album cover. I'll just say that it's on Instagram if you want to check it out. Um, and I had a really, I had a really nice time. I, I went in to use the bathroom, and just as far as protocol, they took my temperature before I could go in, and they were only allowing two people in at a time. Um, so that's how they're handling um, things during COVID. So what did I get? Well, they had a, a more condensed menu, um, and I went with steamed lobster with Jimmy Nardella peppers as an appetizer. I had grilled and braised pork with polenta delicata squash and pumpkin seed salsa as a main. And I usually don't do dessert, but I had to do it because they have cafe panna gelato. And I got salted coconut stracciatelli, uh, with stracciatella with toasted pecans and amano chocolate. And Michael had also sent out a a mocktail for me to drink. It was cider-based. So uh, my take, everything was wonderful. I mean, it was delicious. Delicata squash with anything I would, I I love. And so with the pork was fabulous. My appetizer with the lobster was really tasty. And the gelato was just divine. I'm a huge fan. Um, The ambiance. So great energy being on this block with a few other restaurants. Uh, and there was a jazz trio that set up in the middle of the block, providing music for for lots of different tables outside. I'd say it's perfect for a date night, dinner with friends, or soloists. Interesting tidbit: um, since my dinner, the restaurant they've opened up for the twenty five percent capacity indoor dining, which restaurants in New York City are now allowed to do. And uh, Michael had told me about this collaboration that he's doing with with Haley Meyer, um, with her gelato place, Cafe Pana, and Haley is Danny Meyer's daughter. And personal fun fact, uh, when I did my host Summit Plus social conference earlier this year, Cafe Pana was was one of our partners, and I, I we had there their vanilla blood orange pistachio sundae, which was fabulous. So um, the cost of this meal was $62. That's not including tax and gratuity. And interestingly enough, USHG went back to tipping after all these years of, of being no tipping. So as we touched upon before, you know, it's um, it's it's an interesting mm-hmm. topic. Um, would I go back? Yes, of course. And their website's grammarcytavern.com. And yeah, I have to say it was, it was, I was, I've got, I got used to the USHG no tipping policy so i I, it's like i almost forgot (laughs) yeah danny his his annotated overview and eater a number of years ago i still think is one of the best breakdowns that exists um and also you mentioned mocktails twice in this uh our good friend julia bainbridge just put out her good drinks book that came out i think yesterday if anyone was like into the mock into the mocktails world it's a really it's a beautifully shot book but it's a uh, all non-alcoholic uh very delicious drinks I'm if so i can uh, that. yeah she's if, awesome and and i've i've talked with her before because i don't i don't drink alcohol so that's um 
that's part of my part of my my dining out experiences a lot. But her book is is fabulous. And you know, I actually sat down with her yesterday on our pub day. She's going to be on this week's show, and we actually talked about the mocktail nomenclature and about how that is trying to be rebranded in some ways. So if you know people who don't drink don't feel that you know they're less or mocked or in any way like that for ordering a cocktail. And so alcohol-free uh, drinks or cocktails or things like that, um, or spiritless is sort of where it's trending right now, which is a really interesting concept because even if you do drink, sometimes you just want a really beautifully crafted drink, but you don't want booze or you don't want to have anything in that. And I think seeing the conversation steer that way is, is really nice and also something that dovetails quite nicely with people's relationships during the pandemic as they examine how much or how little they want to drink. Yeah, very true. And I know people don't like the word mocktails and I still, I still say it. Um, I, I mean, a lot of times menus, uh, I know. there's zero proof. There's, there's a, there's new creative ways to, to say non-alcoholic beverage. And um, I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's a good point. And actually I'll also say I'm, I'm now working with, a non-alcoholic craft cocktail Ooh. company called Curious Elixirs. John Wiseman. Yeah. Shout out John. I love him. He's he's amazing and and his his drinks are amazing. They're really they're, they're complex, you know? So um well, cool. Okay. So we'll stay tuned for that. More about non-alcoholic beverages. <laughs> <laughs> um for the final question, uh, we're going to ask you guys to ask a question to my next guest. So I'm having on restaurant owners Carlos Suarez of Bobo, Rosemary's, Claudette, and Rowies, and Jan de Roche Fort, the founder of Bocaria Restaurants. And together they founded Safe Eat, which is a nonprofit part- partnership between New York City restaurant owners and healthy and safety experts at Zero Hour Health. And their mission is to to support restaurants to keep their staff and guests safe. So as we're talking about safety with restaurants. So um, what would you guys like to ask Carlos and Jan? Uh, My question is, we know all the downsides. and Darren just talked about it and used the word decimated. I would like to know what signs of hope uh, and excitement they see uh, from their lessons learned while going through this process and how things might actually improve the restaurant industry, if at all. Great. You want to stick it to what? Just do one question. You have another one. I just, I just need uh, one. Yeah, one, one's <laughs> fine. It's a- okay. Fabulous. I keep saying fabulous. The show. It's like my word of the day. Um, but. Uh, this has been fabulous, and thank you guys so much. I I'm so happy for your long term success with Snacky Tunes and your new book out. And uh, I, where where can people get it? It's it's on Amazon and uh, your local we, we, Yeah, <laughs> fade in first, please. Buy direct from your publisher. If not, bookshop.org um, and support your independent local bookshop. Um, for, we actually, um, next week, we are going to announce our virtual book tour. Uh, we put together an 11 stop virtual book tour and we've partnered with some of the best independent bookshops in America, now serving LA, Omnivore in San Francisco, um, Argostratus in New York, and Cotillier in New Orleans, uh, and Wild Child, which is a natural wine shop and bookshop down in Lafayette, Louisiana. So please support that. And if you can't do that, then we are happy for you to pump our Amazon rankings. And if you just look for Snacky Tunes, we're there. So if you want to get and more tour info, everything's on snackytunes.com. We are kicking off the tour on October 14th, which is our pub date in North America and Australia. The book is actually available internationally right now. Um, and it's going to be hosted by our incredible, amazing friends, Michelle and Ken at now serving in Los Angeles, which is, I would say, the culinary heartbeat right now of this city. And it's been moderated by Jeff Gordnier from Esquire, who also wrote one of our forwards, and will be joined by Andy and Brianna Valdez uh, from Home State, 
who are also contributors to the book. So we are very, very excited. It's always been a dream to um, have a book event hosted at Now Serving, and now we get to fulfill that in about a week. Very cool. Well, congratulations, and uh, I wish you guys much continued success with all of it. And uh, hope to see you in the near-ish future, too. Yeah. 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 We, we will have a meal together again one day soon. Yes, that would be wonderful. So Thank you my so much guest, for having us. My pleasure. Anytime. My guests today have been Darren and Greg Bresnitz. They are the twin brother duo behind Snacky Tunes podcast here on Heritage Radio Network. And they also have a new book out. Snacky Tunes, Music is the Main Ingredient, Chefs and Their Music, and you can get it at Biden. Their, that website's Biden.com. Um, Instagram, you can follow them at Snacky Tunes, at Biden Snaps. Um, and you can follow me at Sherry Bayer, at Bayer PR, and at All Industry. My Facebook page is All in the Industry, and my websites are BayerPublicRelations.com, SherryBayer.com, and AllInTheIndustry.com. All of our shows are archived at heritageradionetwork.org. We are also in iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. Thanks to my engineer today, Amanda Wang. Thanks again to Darren and to Greg and to their publicist, Kong. I'm Sherry Bayer. Till next week, be safe and be well. And thank you for being part of All in the Industry. Bye. All in the Industry is powered by Simplecast. I'm Sherry Bayer, and you're listening to Heritage Radio Network, a member-supported podcast network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. This year, HRN is celebrating 10 years of food radio. For the past decade, we've been taking you behind the scenes of farms, restaurants, breweries, school cafeterias, and more. It's been 10 years, and we're just getting started. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org.